Welcome to another episode of Lifelong Learner. This is the Out of Class Edition with Ben, Janesh, and Matt. Hope you enjoy. Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of Lifelong Learner. Morning, Ben. How are you doing? Janesh, good morning. Yes. Uh, Mike, this is... um this is a little extra episode because we we sort of missed one, and so we're we're doing a bit of a makeup. Mm. Um, it's a back to back from us last week, although yeah. you may not notice that if you're following us because uh, of the release dates. But but um, it's 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 good to do one back to back. But of course, we are missing someone at the moment. I know he's slack. He's slack. So apparently he's coming on, but I'm not holding my breath at the moment. So. We should send him calendar invites. We should. These. We should. Yeah. Um, yeah. Maybe. Oh, well, Actually, we do. I think we do. Um, maybe yeah. on this one, I'm going to put the the picture as a calendar invite with Matt that he's uh, accepted it uh, yeah. as the um, as the release uh, release photo. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Uh, good, mate. What's going on in your world? What's been happening, mate? This week, um, last week was a week of, mate. When we talk, when we last week we took at the end of the episode we talked about intentionally choosing time, um, and it was there was a lot of that in my world. Uh, intentionally choosing family time, intentionally choosing time with Keisha, uh, intentionally choosing time to go. Like so, I'm in a, a downstairs room and getting that flooring done, and go. Ah, oh, as of as of putting it off, and I'm like, you know what? Let's just get it done. Uh, got Will in um, for, for hired hands. Um, so Ryan's son to, to help do some of the heavy lifting as well. And um, yeah, so it's been, um, it's been a, a full week, but not a crazy busy week, if that makes sense. So How's that felt, being intentional with your time and putting your focus with things that are, that at the end of the day are probably the most important things? Mm. Mate, it felt, felt really good because when you, you make that intentional choice, it's like you question, does the other things matter and are they the most important um, and what happens if you miss them? What happens if you pay less time to it? Um, and for, uh, It depends for everyone, but for me, it didn't really matter, right? Things didn't fall off if things didn't break and it it's a kind of solidifies that they're not the most important thing mm. so uh no nah, felt good felt good and it's actually given uh like space funny enough more space mm. Mm, yeah more space and it's less uh less busy work right i kind of i say that to um coaching clients about um do less busy work and do meaningful work or do um outcome based work and when you change your intentionality with your timing i'm finding that it's less busy work right Mm -hmm. less um like hamster wheel less hamster wheel work so Mm -hmm. which has been good it's been yeah it's been good um yeah been good Mm. Right. How about you? How's your week? Mate, that's, it's interesting because there was a, a really good author wrote a book called um, Life CEO, How to Take Charge and Do Your Life's Work, oh, Not really? Your Busy Work. Oh, I think I've read that one. I think I've yeah. read that one. Um, I just think it's by... Who is it by? It's by me. Ah, there you go. Uh, it's by me, Ben Cavasso, Life CEO, How to Take Charge, Do Your Busy Work, Not... Uh, sorry, Do Your Life's Work, <laughs> Not Your Busy Work. Uh, available at all good bookstores and Amazon online. It's a great uh, read. So it's a great read. Uh, mate, what's been it? Well, as you know, I think I mentioned last week we were picking up a puppy. So I picked up a puppy last mate. Friday. He is asleep right now on the floor. Mate. A very busy morning. How, how is that going? And so the listeners, um, and we're going to wait. We'll, we'll post a photo of him with, the, with this episode, not the last episode. Uh, and if you didn't listen to the last episode, highly recommend you listen to the last episode. Uh, ben was full of gusto, promise, certainty. Um, mm. In my eyes, probably a little naive. Um, but, mate, I want to see how has week one been? Um. It has been all-consuming. 
and we're not at week one yet, mate. We are like four days in. <laughs> so it has been all consuming. Um, I am, I was, I was chatting about this yesterday, uh, Monday to my wife. Hey, Maddie, good to see you, mate. Morning, lads. I'm intrigued. Carry on. I will pick up what's happening. You've got a bit of days of our lives filter on there, and that's either on purpose or because you've got a greasy fingerprint on your camera lens. Might be, yeah, it could be greasy. I'd say yeah. greasy. Um, a bit of bit of lotion you've got on Just the camera lens. Bring out the cleaning crew. Hang on. There we get on that. Oh, look at you. Um, hey, uh, on Monday, like my days are sacred. My mornings are like I should say, my mornings are sacred. I can remember grade four. So what is that? I was probably ten. Um, my dad would wake up early and bring in a cup of tea. And he'd say, "Ben, come on, wake up, mate. It's it's morning. I'm sleeping in. Wake up." Mm-hmm. And I'd sit up in bed with a cup of tea and I'd listen to a bit of music at ten years of age and read a book. And that continued from the, the from age of ten through till I left home to go to uni at like eighteen. So my mornings have just become this really sacred thing. Well, since we picked up Bromley. Uh, the, oh, mate, so the, what's the name? Bromley. 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 Bromley, Brom, Brom Bromley. For sure. Okay. Um, and since we picked up Bromley, uh, my mornings are a complete shamozzle. Like absolute complete shamozzle. <laughs> uh, you know, he wakes up at 5.30, which is fine. It's my wake-up time. But he's full on because he slept all night. Well, most of the night and uh you know just he's in full energy just crazy mode there is no peace and quiet um so mate it's it's been a little tricky so i was talking to my wife on monday and i said i gotta have my mornings you know i'm happy to do <laughs> later in the day i'm happy to do like i'm happy to be up during the night put him out if he needs to go to the loo happy to do the easy stuff I gotta have my mornings. But you're gonna have your mornings with him, mate. No, yeah. but it's it's no, that's not my mornings. That's <laughs> that's Brom's mornings. No, but he wants to have some Brom, um, um, some Brom and Ben time in the morning, mate. He's bonding with you. Yeah, he can bond. He can bond after nine o'clock. <laughs> um, so, so, and it was kind of a little bit of. I was in a bit of a crisis. I was a bit tired from being up throughout the night putting him up. And my morning had been a schmozzle and I was pretty close, I reckon, to being in tears, to be honest, when I was talking to my wife at about 8 a.m. Um, and uh, so, when, so when you told her that we're, we're going to have to change this, it was more of, please, please, let's no, change this. Was, I need my mornings back. Yeah, there was maybe a bit of please in it, but there was more a tone of I'm feeling... Give the dog back. Oh, 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 oh. After 10 days. <laughs> that was probably the tonality behind what okay. I said. Got it. And uh they were totally unspoken, but that was an there was an energy there around that. And so uh that afternoon people actually took me seriously. <laughs> and um they we have rearranged. Uh so Tuesday yesterday morning, uh I rang my daughter Eden at 5 30 and said, Yep, remember you're up. Come and get uh, Bromley and let me have my mornings. Oh, don't you live in the same house? We do, but she's upstairs uh, asleep. Yeah. Um, so uh, I stayed in bed because Brom was still asleep and rang her quietly from the bed going, come and get Bromley. Uh, I'm, I was getting up anyway, but I, I, I didn't want to wake Bromley and then have to face the crazy dog just woken. Uh, <laughs> surely, like, surely you just scoop up that that thing and open the door and uh, shut the door and I'm going to have my morning. Yeah. Well, that's what, that's, that. that's what I did. I said, Eden, come on down, get him out of the cage. And, you know, I want you to experience the first 30 seconds as he wakes and is completely full of joy. Um, so uh, anyway, uh, mate, so that was yesterday. And then this morning, of course, I had my walk and talk uh, with Ryan. And so you didn't want to do it with, um, with, do you do it with Brock? Well, there's no walk. See, Brom, he he doesn't, he doesn't want to walk. 
What the do you moment mean, there's mate? any tension on the lead, mm. Rom instantly stops. Mate, but what about all the YouTube videos? Listeners, remember last episode. It's all the well, YouTube videos, mate, the study, all the back work. Yeah, well, I actually hadn't watched a YouTube on... I just assumed your dogs walk on a lead. <laughs> and so, to be honest, uh, funnily enough, this morning I was on YouTube Googling, why won't my dog walk? <laughs> <laughs> why won't my puppy walk on the lead? And uh, pretty oh, much the answer is because he just doesn't want to. And uh, <laughs> it's something that you need to train into him to walk on the lead. Um, so anyway, so this morning it was a carry brom uh, and talk. Okay. <laughs> so, do some bicep curls, mate. Sorry, Maddie. Did you do some bicep curls with Brom while you were walking? Just get a bit of an upper body burn. But, well, only for about 50 to 100 metres. And then we've got walked, puppy curls. We walked to the cafe and nice. and had coffee. Um, so oh, uh, That's funny because my dog, um, Wild Dog, never been on the lead. It must be the same as Bromley. I put, him, put her on the lead for the first time. She looked up at me and refused to walk. And then... Then I got a couple of steps out of her and I thought, oh, we're getting traction here. And then I let go of the lead, which was foolish. And then she didn't know the lead was a lead. She thought it was a snake trying to attack her. So she shot off down the road, running away from the lead. I was like, oh, this is not going well. Maybe she'll never be a lead dog. How can we, is yeah. there a way around this? Or do I have to start at the very beginning? YouTube, I think, mate. YouTube. <laughs> YouTube. Mate, so if you had to summarize, Mate, week, not even week one, four days of dog ownership. No, it's about five days. It coming was, into he the mentioned day. before he was two and a half days in before he got that feeling. Mate. You know that feeling? So yeah. how how is it all? I like your schedule. I like the, the listeners. Ben sent me his uh, his morning or his rough day-ish schedule uh, before Rob and now the current one. And, mm. um, mate, that's, uh, is it, I'm assuming it's more than what you thought. Yes, mate, it is a little bit more than what I thought. And I, I, might, I might read it out to our listeners because uh, I think there's a bit of, bit of fun in it. Um, so I, I did a Facebook post for listeners and uh, um, it says April 2023 routine. 5 a.m., get up and make a cup of tea. 5.45, read something interesting. 6 o'clock, meditation. 6.15, drive to the beach. 6.30, go for a 30-minute run. 7 o'clock, coffee at Virgo. 7.30, drive home, shower, and get into the day. Doesn't that just sound like there's no better way to start your day than that? <laughs> Since the 6th of May, 2023, 5.30 a.m., get dog, Brom, up and take it for a wee. 5.35, get Brom breakfast. 5.45, play tug with Brom. 5.55, take Brom out to do a poo. 6 o'clock, carry Brom inside and wipe the poo gag off his bum. 6.05, make myself a tea. 6.10, drink 50% of the tea. The rest knock, got knocked out of my hand by, you guessed it, Brom. 6.15 to 6.45, play with Brom while saying no a lot. No, don't eat the computer cables. No, don't eat electrical cables. No, don't eat my meditation cushion. No, don't chew pass chair. No, don't eat timber flooring. No, don't eat my Ugg boot. No, don't chew my magazine. No, don't chew the carpet. 7 o'clock, take Brom outside for another wee. 7.10. Play with Brom Moore, starting to get tired signs, both me and the dog. 7.29, Brom asleep and me wondering which way is up. 7.30, wondering if it's too early for a glass of Foxy's Hangout. <laughs> P.S. You're wondering where mummy is. Well, she's fast asleep, dreaming slash scheming of things to do as a family. Uh, but she's not the morning person, right? So She's not a morning person. So, so that's um, as we speak, she's still in bed sleeping. Glorious, yes. glorious. She's got it dialed in. She wants another puppy. So this is easy. <laughs> <laughs> we can do two. Yeah. Takes care uh, of itself till eight a.m. and that's usually when I wake. And oh wow! <laughs> so the contrast of mornings. And uh, for those listeners that have got a newborn baby, maybe this is you know kind of ringing true or a puppy as well, but. Uh, they tell me it only lasts for the first six months. Yeah, <laughs> I was about to say because I don't have that much experience. I was I was a kid when we had a puppy. How long does that last for? And how long until you can integrate Brom into your morning routine? And I guess 
There's a chance he can't. What if he doesn't want to go have that coffee? What if he doesn't want to walk along the beach? Maybe he wants to walk through the woods. That's stressful. What if they don't align? What if they never align? Are you going to have to change your morning routine? No. Maybe okay. there's some compromise, man. What, when do you, when in life do you compromise? Yeah, it's interesting because flexibility is important. I tell you, um, how often I, I, I would you know? A jaw's head a smiling. lot of things that you've been doing for a long time, and there was something that happened. It was probably two or two years ago now. I was getting a haircut and I was at the hairdressers and I've always part my hair on the left side, right? Always on the left side, forever on the left side. But there's always this kind of weird cowlick that happens, right? You know, every time. And I go to the hairdresser, mate, can you just like cut it? It always kind of flicks up weird there. Yeah, a bit of hair product. Anyway, a couple of years ago, I was at the hairdresser and he's, he's you know, doing his thing. And he starts to put the part on the other side. I go, mate, oh, no, it's on the, on the left. He goes, mate, you, your part really is more on that on the right side. Like, that's naturally where your part is. Well, you, you're going to have to use a lot of product to force it to be on the other side. Really? Oh. He goes, yeah, like, just like, this is where your part is. You, I go, mate, for 52 years, <laughs> I've been putting it on the wrong side. <laughs> And so now my hair's parted on the right hand side where the parties. Mate, uh, that's an amazing ability to let go. I would have thought you were going to tell me, nah, yeah. couldn't do it. Oh, I just told him. There was a bit of tension there. And then I said, all right, mate, I'm Mr. Flexible. <laughs> I'm <laughs> parting on the other side. Mate, I would say your kids would beg to differ that you are Mr. Flexible. Um, if there's times I'm flexible, mate. There's if time. we called any of them right now, live, and said, "Hey, is your dad Mister Flexible?" Well, don't describe. Call what do you describe reckon? your dad in three words? I'm not sure <laughs> flexible will be one of them. Uh, the most flexible. Yeah. So Logan, he has called me on it a few times, and I just say to him, "Mate, I'm 50, 55. <laughs> I know what I like. I just spend my whole life working out what I like. I just know what I want. I like my coffee extra hot. I don't want it lukewarm. <laughs> I, just, I don't want it lukewarm. I want it extra hot. If I say the word extra hot, right, just give me it, make it sure it's extra hot. Well, that's yeah. Funny. There is nothing worse than when you get like a drive through extra hot oat latte. You get it, you put it in your car, it feels hot. You drive away, you get two minutes down the road and you've got to take the first sip and it's that's lukewarm. Cool. Mm. Mm-hmm. And what do you do then? You reconsider your whole life because you're like, fuck, I just spent $6 on a lukewarm latte. Mm-hmm. It's going to sit in my car now and I'm still going to be thirsty and not have my coffee and I've still got an hour trip. You're probably planning your spot that set of traffic lights where you're going to open the door and just, just pour it down the gap. Is that littering? You're probably wondering to yourself. Surely not. Is it? That's a good question. If you have a liquid that you haven't finished consuming in your car, <coughs> you just tip it out on the ground. Is that littering? Well, yeah. you'll find out if there's a Karen behind you because you'll you'll get a letter in the mail. Yeah, <laughs> littering. But mm. if it's... $5 million. If it is something that's, like, consumable, like, so um, it's obviously non, non-toxic, non why would it be littering? Uh, I totally get if you're... Dumping well, out oil at your door while you're driving or paint. But what is the this, difference if you tripped and you fell and you dropped your coffee? This is a very good question and spills into something that I was wondering myself to yesterday. A banana, an apple core, you know, these things that for generations, thousands of years even, have just been discarded naturally in the local vicinity, a bush, a tree, I mean, surely that's totally legit. You're actually benefiting the earth by throwing a banana over the front windshield into the gutter that runs along next to the highway. Surely that's not illegal, but it feels wrong every time you do it. Does anyone else? Do you guys throw the banana, the apple core? Just me? No? Frown upon. (laughs) Oh, shit. (laughs) You better. I eat it all. Yeah. Yeah, no, 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 never throw anything out my window. No. I've done the uh, the apple core, 
Banana peel's a bit much, mate. Banana peel doesn't seem like it would disintegrate. I feel like... Oh, they love it. A banana's only going to last about a week outside before yeah. it... A banana breaks down quicker than an apple breaks down. Yeah. Okay. That's I'll great for like the, the, the critters will get to the apple. A little possum will kind of have a little, little, little snack in the afternoon. But That's no. why I launch it over the road into, you know, a nice... Gr- I don't leave it on the road. That's... Murder. Mate, I just Mate, feel what are you like... saying, Janesh? You're saying that animals in the wild would normally peel a banana, only eat the inside and not eat the skin. No, no, I'm just saying uh, in Victoria, bananas don't just naturally grow. So I'm not necessarily going to throw it out there and go... Oh, oh. because they're not natural, native. They shouldn't right. be discarded in the native mm, environment. Right. I agree. I don't discard them. Mate, I feel Mate, like I'm when I'm you... I'm not sure, but... I don't think apple trees are native to us. No, 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 anyway, anyway. But they're, they're more around. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's interesting. I know there's a, yeah, it is that you get a funny feeling, but then there's another half of you that goes, like, it's going to break down, it's going to feed the plants, the little bugs are going to yeah. get it. Everyone. This is the dilemma, right? The conditioning, the domestication of me as a human knows that, ah, I shouldn't do that. But then the logical, rational part of my brain goes, hang on a second. Mm. I this thought, is actually all right. I thought you were going to say the, the Mario of Mario Kart part of your brain goes, I'm going to throw it out the window and go, and the next car's going to skid on it. That's what I get a feeling of. You're playing Mario Kart and you're channeling, I'm just going to throw a banana peel out the window. Driving to work would be a lot more fun, wouldn't it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, mean, I think um, while, while you guys are happy with chatting, I'm just going to just Google what is um, is it... I bet you I'm going to put money on it. In Victoria, $5,000 fine for throwing a banana out the window. It's got to be something like that. But what if it lands? What if it doesn't land on soil? It just lands on concrete or the footpath? Yeah, that's frowned upon. That's that. I think that's littering. I think if it lands in soil. We've had Dan Andrews as our premier. Uh, in Victoria, the fines for littering will depend on what the item is. Cool. If you drop a piece of fruit or any small item, you'll be issued a fine of $363. No way. You're However, that up. any hot, including cups of coffee, maybe not, that's not what I says, uh, <laughs> or burning litter like a cigarette butt will see the fine double to $727. Where do they get these amounts from? $720. It's littering and it is a, an offence. Wow. Okay. So that's why I don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Why well, I'll never do it again. Okay. So yeah. bananas go in the bin mm. and then from the bin they get planted in the ground when they do those mass let's hide all the rubbish because we actually don't recycle or do proper yeah. waste management. We just bury that shit in the middle of Australia. So you can't throw it in a garden bed, but you can put it in the bin where it'll end up eventually with all the plastic underground. Mm. Just like the apples. Put them in the bin with the plastic that they were all wrapped in in Mm. the bin as well. It's interesting that we've developed a society that likes to wrap things that already have natural wrappings. We like to cover that shit in plastic first. Mm. That's good for the environment. Okay. Thanks, Daniel Andrews. So now we know. Everyone knows. Listeners all know. Mm. Put your stuff in the bin, particularly anything that's on fire, because if it's on fire... It doubles. uh, Put it out before you put it in the bin. I'm sure it triples if you put something flaming on fire in a bin. But, yeah, mm. fired, fired things, flaming things, flaming things, double. Yeah. Someone should tell the people that drop their cigarette cigarette butts on the ground that. Mm. Maybe that's why they drop it on the ground and they quickly stub it with their foot so that it's not oh, burning anymore so they only get a $360. Yeah. Half price. <laughs> <That's laughs> right. Extra little. 50% off. If I don't, if I don't, if I don't stamp it out, it's, it's gonna be it's not gonna be 50% it's like, off. It's like our electricity bills. Do the right thing, 50% <laughs> off. Pay on time. Put that shit out. Oh. These are the big things. These are the big things, listeners. Yeah. I'd be interested to our listeners just to comment. Um, all three of you in the comments below, just, you know, what are your thoughts on throwing fruit out into the paddock? So I'm not just saying, mm. you know, walking along the nature strip, mm-hmm. uh, not in the nature strip, uh, walking along the footpath and just kind of just tossing it on the ground on the bitumen or the, on the concrete, but I'm talking about like throwing it out into the bush. Yeah. Uh, what are you, what are your thoughts on that? I'd be interested to see what people say. Mm. Uh, Me too. 
Yes, hopefully we've been controversial and we get some negative feedback. It's a good. So you two love that, don't you? You love a bit of negative feedback. Hashtag no no such thing as bad publicity. That warms you guys up. You're ready. Just starts the conversation. Like a little bit of conflict. Yeah. Mm. Not stand for something. You can be everything to everyone, but it means you're nothing to nobody. Everything to everyone, but nothing to nobody? You try to be everything to everybody. Mm. You end up being nothing to nobody. Okay, yeah. In Just context, land. that makes sense. Land, grey. You, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. You can try and you can try and be everything. Be everything. You no, know, the the guy that's kind of right in the middle. You're neither left mm. wing or right wing. You're just in the middle, and you know, uh, and that's what we're seeing. You know, currently in Australian politics, we've got our what was traditionally our right wing Liberal Party has just become so just middle of the road that they're now nothing to nobody. Uh, and they're struggling to get votes. They're struggling to get traction because they're not really standing for anything. And traditionally, what they would be more is way more right-wing, anti-woke, uh, anti-moderation, and now they're just they're at zero. Yeah, they're trying to uh, they're trying to please by trying to please everyone. They're pleasing no one. Yes. Right. Mm. So it's like. Uh, you got people on either side who who do stand for things. Go well, nah, you're not on my side because you're kind of half R, but you're not. Your actions don't really follow. Um, do you think? I think I've seen more and more of that. Probably in the last five years, or well, I should say more of that in a way that people um, aren't sharing what they stand for as mm-hmm. openly. Mm-hmm. Uh, because they want to be potential people pleasers um, or they're concerned on who they potentially may not please, not necessarily uh, who they may get offside. Um, when it didn't really matter and there's a ways in the... Previously, I feel like you could do that and you wouldn't. You can do it respectfully so you're not necessarily offending them, but you go, hey, look, this is where I stand and you can still have a amicable conversation you can still be um you could still even be friends right but people mm. were not uh were not afraid to share um kind of where they stand now it's like a they may stand for something but publicly they don't mm. why is that you reckon what do you reckon Matty? the slow systematic PC culture, mm. people are really concerned about saying the wrong thing, which sucks really because, yeah, like authenticity is harder to find yet again because people are scared to say mm. the wrong thing. But how do you, yeah, like that's part of learning, isn't it? Like I'm one of those people who kind of, I shoot from the hip a lot of the time. <laughs> I learn from my mistakes. I offend the wrong person. I say the wrong thing to someone and then they educate me in a conversation. And if they got valid points, then that changes the way I think about something, you know, it might change me by 5%. I leave that conversation maybe slightly more um, compassionate or, or I'm more like, no, this is, this feels right. I miss those kind of, um, interactions i think that's why i like this podcast so much because we don't agree on everything you know sometimes um we do disagree but we can still chat it out and yeah it did feel i think you're right though on the timeline i don't know why but it feels like the last five years it feels like there's been some censorship on a big scale and it's also happening you know on the macro and it's also happening on the micro and i think it's tied to dramatically tied to covid some of that stuff, people are scared to talk about that and that's spilling into other things. Do you think that lines up, Ben, with that timeline or was it happening before and maybe we're just I'm more conscious of it now based on that last few years? It seems to, well, it's, I mean, so I'm the oldie, right, and been around a long time and it was it just didn't exist when I was 30. Mm. Yeah, So in the last 20 years, it certainly started to appear and I'd say in the last 10 and definitely in the last five, I was listening to Elon Musk and he talks about something called 
I'm going to say it's the, it's, this is not it, but it's something like woke infected. Um, and that, you know, and that's one of the reasons that he says uh, that he bought Twitter is that Twitter was becoming sensitive, um, censored mm. and that, you know, the, the number one, I think, amendment is the, you know, right to free speech in America. And he said that was disappearing. And mm. so he wanted to bring back free speech. And he's all for say what whatever you want, you know, and be ready for the consequences if it's not popular, but you should have the freedom to say what you want. Mm-hmm. Um, and mm-hmm. that has certainly disappeared because, and I think in answer to your question, Janesh, I think there is just such a huge backlash that the the minority can be so loud and so harsh and so brutal, interestingly, uh, that the woke are so brutal that you just you just can't step out of line. Mm. You just you just can't step out of line. So, and I think that I think people are self censoring um, and not speaking their truth. It, it it's really interesting that um, that minority seems like the volumes turned up, but go back two and a half years and there was a minority where it was turned down, and so there's something going on where some minorities are magnified for some reason, don't know why, and others are kind of repressed, you know, censored. So it's it's really interesting because, you know, I've been part of a minority that thought differently around COVID and that was a really small message and it was quietened down a lot and you felt like no one's listening and, you know, you go to a, a rally and there's 500,000 people there and it's reported as a couple thousand and I'm wondering... It just felt very strange in a time where we're like, let's listen to minorities, but we're not listening to a minority. But then this this consistently over the last five years, this minority is everyone listen to this minority. And I found that really curious, why some things are censored, why some things are amplified, some things are just pushed off to the side. I never really considered that prior to the last few years. Um, but that minority seems to be one that is represented, um, supported by the mainstream, which is curious because mm. I would have thought that would be something that wouldn't be acknowledged by the mainstream because they're too busy with other priorities. Mm. Mm, that's good, mate. What do you think, Janesh? Mm. Yeah, I think they're coming back to where what people stand for. I think we, as a society, are worried about too worried about what we say, so then in the end we don't say anything at all, right? Mm. It's like, uh, yeah, okay, either agree or go with the majority or they're, oh, yep, I'll take that into consideration and they don't actually pick a side because they're, it's like that um, analysis paralysis, like, all right, there's so many stakeholders now that five years ago those stakeholders they were still there, but they weren't stakeholders. Their, their, their opinions or their things didn't really matter as much anymore. But now it's like, oh, I need to I need to take into account this person's view and that person's view. And then the person walking down the street, that person's view, because they hear me talking in my own backyard, uh, I'm not sure what they're going to think about me. And it's like, whoa, and they end up saying nothing. Mm-hmm. Um, and it's, I think people, oh, yeah, I don't know. I think they need to be encouraged to make their own just to have their own opinion, um, I think. But I think, again, be okay and aware that there may be backlash, but it's okay to have your own opinion, right, and say what you want to say. And there's a, that's where great ideas come from, right? That's where things, um, yeah, greater things happen. It's not – great things don't happen if we all agree, right? It's uh, great things don't happen and uh, – yeah, if we don't challenge norms and go, hey, look, is there a better way? Is there something else happening? Um, so, yeah, but people... And if we don't challenge to... abnorms, mm. we don't challenge the new, this new great idea. Well, let's just challenge. Is it a new great idea? I think that's that's super important. But I think what you said is really gold there, Janesh, is that, you know, it's in, in the friction between two objects is where we do get the spark. You know, mm-hmm. the lights of fire that can be really powerful and really useful. And of course, sometimes when there is friction, we get a spark and a lights of fire that is is damaging. Um, yeah, I, th- 
I agree. I think just using that analogy, sometimes you get smoothing too. Mm, you know, I'm when two things come together and they rub against each other, you get the best of both worlds and you end up with something much cleaner and, and a better um, thing because of that friction with something else. They've called out a rough point, an edge that mm. could have done some damage otherwise if it hadn't have been Sandback. addressed with some friction. I think that's a really good analogy. It works both ways. Mm. Great ideas come from that friction yeah but there's a lack of friction though at the moment as a whole not just in like towards minorities or whatever but i think just as a whole just in a um like just even interesting like so I, i'm the person if someone cuts a line i will say hey excuse me is there, there's a line right but a lot of people don't a lot of people just go just just they'll mumble something on their breath and they just won't say anything Maybe this person's unaware or whatever or just doesn't want... I don't think so that's conflict. It might be friction. But like this was like, oh, okay, great. I'll, I'll line up. But like it's just... That's just not... That's not normal anymore. I think um, ben, ben and I and a few others were away a couple of weekends ago and we were saying that things that we think is normal, like maybe we're the outliers, Right, where maybe because all these other things are like, oh, this should be normal. It should be normal to be able to have that friction or go, hey, not if someone got your order wrong, go, hey, sorry, that's not exactly what I ordered. It's okay to say that, but be like, oh, no, no, I can't, I can't. And it's, yeah, the more I think about it since that conversation on that weekend, Ben, I was like, oh, maybe we are the outliers because the more you look around, everyone doesn't, no one else does it. Mm. Mm. I tell, I, I tell you what, I'm holding a topic in my mind that I've been thinking about the last few days, which is going to generate a lot of friction. Go for and it. I've, and I've been wondering where's the safe place to talk about it. Um, and I've been talking a little bit to my partner about it. And this is actually the first time that I've wanted to contact my local MP. I don't even know the process. I'm embarrassed to admit, right? I don't even know what they're called. But I took the effort to work out how do I contact my local MP? How do I bring this up? How do I have a conversation? And I was clunky and awkward and I ended up speaking to this lady called Ant, who was very helpful. She must be, I don't know, some kind of secretary who does managing of directing calls and stuff. But I listened to a guy called John Campbell online. And John Campbell's like a 65-year-old retired doctor, very, very intellectual, and he's like old school. So he can report on stuff completely impartial, how it's meant to be. You know how you remember a referee used to be in sport. You wouldn't have a referee who wants that team to win. It, it just seems like we've lost these impartial people who can communicate facts without getting emotionally involved. And, and he got basically canned for a week. And the moment someone gets now, someone gets censored and disappears for a week, I become more interested <laughs> in whatever they were talking about the week before they got censored, right? And so I've been watching this guy for a long time, for the last two and a half years, and I've missed the last month or something, but he got taken offline. So I'm like, I want to know what he got taken offline for. And he got censored for having a meeting with an MP who was talking about adverse reactions to vaccines and talking about um, excess deaths. And I thought, that's really curious. So I just looked it up and, and looked into it. And it's super interesting. And this is a conversation I want to have with people. But the moment you say vaccine or excess death, the everyone just, oh, there's, there's, you can see them just get nervous and uncomfortable and no one wants to talk about it. But for two years, we had politicians jumping online or, you know, on um, press conferences and reporting numbers every day, every single day. 200 people died or, you know, we were 16 people are in hospital, all these numbers. And excess deaths, these numbers are huge in every single country all across the world at the moment. Like, for the, it's insane. Like 10, 20, 30, 40% higher for like a couple of months and then back down to 10, back down to 20. If you look at the last year, the graph is like 10 to 20% consistently above norms. No one's talking about it. Not a single person. No one wants to talk about it. And, and the correlates dates match up. So 2022. And if you look at the statistics on, um, from the government website, 
the statistics for um, annual deaths has always been consistent. So 2015, 2016, 2017, 2018, they just report the numbers. But 2020, the numbers for 2020 and 2022 have been taken out of the spreadsheet and put somewhere else. And it's just all a real mess. So I would encourage for anyone who is up for a controversial topic, um, do a little bit of research into excess deaths and have that conversation with some people because that has got to be one of the most important conversations that needs to be had. There's hundreds, thousands of people dying of no one knows what and no one's talking about it. Mm. It's insane. Yeah, mate. It's a, it's a, it's a. It, whether that is truth or not truth, you should be allowed to talk about it mm. without being censored. And you know, this has gone on for years. You know, you look at um, totalitarian states where you know if you speak out against the government, you know, like places like China, and you know, some Middle Eastern countries, etc., uh, and places like Australia. If you speak out against the narrative, you will be shut down. And in Australia, we don't make people disappear, uh, I think. But in many other countries, you know, people disappear if you speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And uh, so it's been around a really long time that governments want to control the narrative because it keeps them in control. Mm -hmm. It's been around for such a long time, um, the idea of controlling the narrative that keeps the the status quo, um, mm. unfortunately. So what do you think, Janesh? Yeah, I would say in terms of wrapping up, I would, yeah, I definitely agree that I think we're seeing more of, uh, more in uh, Western society and Western countries that, uh, that control of that narrative coming out, uh, especially in the last few years. Uh, however, now I feel like there's a little bit more like eye opening. There's more data now, and people that were on one side or indifferent were like, "Hold on, what is this now?" Um, because it's it's after it's after the fact, um, which is interesting. So, but in terms of takeaways from today, I would say oh, I think. Be okay with where you stand um, and start to share it more. Start to share it more, obviously, uh, where you feel comfortable, um, like your circle, your inner circle. And, um, yeah, I think it'd be, be okay with it. It's like that be, that feeling of being okay in your own skin. And I think it's, it's important. Uh, otherwise, you lose. There's a potential of losing yourself and who you are uh, if, if you don't. So, 